now seems an appropriate time to remind people to turn off their phones. We've done that sooner. Um, and also, for those of you who are turning your phones on silent so you can uh, use social media, the hashtag up on the wall there is GP Leader um, for the event. Um, and I'd start by calling a couple of people, well, group three people who've submitted uh, questions in advance. We'll take three questions and then I'll let the, the panel come back on those three. Um, can I start by calling John Street? I think I've remembered what it was. My name is John Street from Bromley Green Party, and my question is, what, to each of the candidates, what is your unique selling point? I.e., what would you say makes you stand out from the other candidates? Um, and we've got a question from Julia Michelson. Hi. Um, so my question is, as much as we can all be proud of being green, campaigning experience teaches many of us that the green label needs a lot of voters to pigeonhole us a single-issue party and not to engage with our broader messages and policies. So how far do, do you see this as a problem and what would you do to counteract it? And the third one is from Haroon. Uh, have the candidates seen these questions? No. Now, look, because on, on, on my... <laughs> 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 no, I'm sorry, I'll stand here so I can see you lot as well. But look, the preamble goes like this. We've arrived at a point in history where the dominant GDP world model is not working. This is the world of growth, financial return, key performance indicators, corporate report, monitoring systems, and incentive schemes. And we know where they've got to in financial sector. It's the dominant culture that determines not only the corporate world, but also government and civil society organisations. Alongside this GDP mindset What's is the emerging... The I'm just coming to... Sorry, I just want to set the context. Sorry. Alongside this GDP mindset is the emerging post-GDP model, a model in which different things count. Our personal development, our spiritual growth. You can read the rest. We in the Green Party are squarely part of the post-GDP model. My question is this, and it's in two parts. How will you as leader be promoting and presenting the post-GDP model? And secondly, what alliances do you think we need to make or create in order to secure greater voter support for the post-GDP model? Great. Um, thanks very much. So, three questions. Um, what makes you different? Um, how do we present, stop ourselves being pigeonholed and uh, maybe tackle being posted? Do you want two minutes for all three? <laughs> um, I, I think we'll, we'll give you three for the, the first one. And the first person on uh, the first round of answers is Peter. Right, um, nice to start with all the easy questions. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go to Haroon's one first of all. I think we need to inform the public a little bit more. I think people kind of understand that something's gone wrong with the system. That they don't quite understand what, it's very complex, nobody knows what derivatives are, nobody understands really that actually this is a crisis that was kicked off in the 1990s in the American property market. Nobody really understands that actually you can <coughs> issue debt out of nowhere and actually there's no collateral necessarily with that. And that the capitalism that we've been experiencing for the last few hundred years is debt capitalism. And I think that's how we should be referring to it, debt capitalism, because Actually, everything that has been, um, particularly in the last few decades, that's been built, that's been constructed, this idea of growth and better standards of living, it's come with a huge price, which is debt. Debt that's saddled round our children's necks, our grandchildren's necks. Exactly the time we need to find a huge amount of money to deal with this impending crisis of climate change. And I think we'll, we'll do more about climate change there. But that, that's one point I do. It's a very complex question. I hope you email me, Haroon, and I'll do more to follow on from that. Um, going on, in terms of the pigeonhole question as well, do we get pigeonholed? Yes, we do. And what's, what's in one way our greatest asset is also our greatest liability, if you like. Because for some people, you'll knock on a door and uh, you, you knock and you say, you know, calling around from the Greens, oh yeah, I love the environment, you love animals, great, Greenpeace, yeah, I, I give money to you. And you, you, you've got a sympathetic audience straight away. But people think that's all that you stand for. And I think that's the limitation that's put on it. Now, there are ways to overcome that. And we know that some of our European Green Party cousins have done that. So if you talk to the Greens in Vienna, they will speak to you about how they are best known for the housing policy. 
and for fight for people's housing rights. And that's something that I think we need to be known for. Housing is one of my key issues in this campaign because it's one of the key battlefields in the fight against climate change because it's something that we can have a real control over, both individually, but also even if we get elected into councils, it's some, somewhere we can have an impact where we have already had an impact in a number of local authorities. How long have I got left, John? 40 seconds. Right, John, what's my unique selling point? Um, if, I'm, if I'm going to give you... Uh, uh, a kind of serious answer, it would be going back to what I said as the opening statement, that I think I can speak to a number of different communities based on my background, based on my past experience. And if you want a less serious answer to that, before I took up politics in, in terms of active campaigning in 2002, kind of full-time campaigning, dedicating my life to it, I used to do stand-up comedy. So I promise, I promise speeches with jokes. Okay, thank you. I've never practiced as a stand-up comedian, so I'm not going to attempt to uh, follow that up with the following joke. Um, three questions. Uh, unique selling point. Um, I think one person uh, identified, I think this quite ni nicely for me on Twitter, they described me as post-watermelon. Now, I think probably everyone in the room knows what watermelon means, and they said not post-watermelon, not anti-watermelon. I absolutely passionately believe in our social justice agenda. I believe that we have to fight for every wage to be a living wage, for benefits to be a decent sum of money that's enough for people to live on and to be available for everyone who needs them. But I also think we've got to tie that together and make sure that we never lose sight of the green agenda. The fact that we have a very, very short period of time in which we can keep this planet livable. We really have to make sure that we keep fighting the social justice and those two things are very much tied together. You can't ask people who aren't quite sure where tomorrow's meals are coming from, who are switching off the heating in mid-winter because they're scared about the bill. You can't ask those people to cut back. You've got to do less. What we've got to do is have a profound redistribution within Britain and within the world, but we've got to do that within a green framework. So you know, I believe that I bring the uh, social side and the environmental side together, and I'll keep focusing on those together. And organisationally, my focus will be truly national, right across England and Wales. I think that we can win at least four MEP seats in two years' time, and before that, I think we can win a huge number of councillors. And I pledge to you that if I'm elected leader, I'll be travelling up and down and around the country in the week before the election spread around the country, being everywhere, trying to do everything I possibly can to get as many people as possible elected. On the green selling, um, uh, the problem of being green, uh, I'm sure I've, the experience I've had that many people have had, you arrive at the door and they say, wait a minute, just stay there. And they come back with a bundle of bottles and say, which ones of these can I recycle? <laughs> it's like, uh, I wanted to talk to you about the election actually. but. What we've got to do is keep talking loudly and clearly about education, about health, all the things we have strong policies on. But how often do we get on Newsnight about it? And how often do you look at the website and see a really good press release about those kind of issues? We've got to do much better on that. And I know it works. I was talking to Julian Roskins, who's our newest Green Councillor, just elected in Malvern Hills. Mm. Um, and, he, and he was saying that um, 14 months ago on the doorstep, he was really struggling to get people to talk to him anything except about green issues. Fourteen months later, with a couple of strong green councillors in place, it's made a real difference. People want to talk about education, about health, <coughs> about jobs. So, you know, track record really does deliver. And finally, in a very short period of time, post-GDP, um, we need to sell, tell everyone we can have a better life. As Caroline says, it's not a question of going in, wearing hair shirts in caves with candles. We can spend more time with our children, we can spend more time in our garden, we can spend less time working, and we can have a better quality of life. And we need to sell that to everybody. Thank you. Um, my unique selling point. Um, well, I've held elected office. I was elected in 2006 as a councillor down in Lewisham, uh, along with... Darren Johnson and Dean Walton in Broccoli Ward. We got two wards together. We had a big campaigning drive. There was issue base behind that, but we were all elected. I was on two select committees, various other bodies. Uh, I worked with the Lewisham 
consult, uh, community consultative police group, um, and I was then selected by a cross-party group to chair the borough-wide Women's Health Inequality Review. So while I was there holding elected office 2006 to 2010, I was also London campaigns coordinator and negotiating with uh, the needs for national um, campaigns across England and Wales. In addition to that, I remember talking to Darren and Caroline and saying, look, I'm going to do this work, it's work with the trade unions, it's not going to end up with a quick fact check, suddenly intellectual funds, but I think it's important. I started work with Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group five or six years ago. We delivered annual conferences. We got Green Party issues, ideas, people. I got uh, elected Greens onto the main platforms at all of those uh, conferences, the debates, the forums, where we were talking about the future of work. Um, organising skills. Um, I was there as founder member of the Coalition of Resistance. It's a national body uh, against privatisation and austerity measures and against the scapegoating of any vulnerable groups that this government or uh, a government in waiting might try to use in order to split uh, the electorate so that we fight amongst ourselves instead of looking to see who the real enemy is and to see whether or not, because most people still don't know, that there are economic alternatives. <coughs> so that's me. Chair of the Coalition Resistance is fast track. If you decide you want me to be the leader for this two year period where we're 13,000 members plus and we want to grow, I could put us at the heart, it's the shorthand to say, it's not just some Greens, it's the Green Party. They're there with us on the ground. Green Label Environment, again, it sort of answers the same thing. We are still seen as mainly environmental party, no matter what we do. Sometimes, even when 90% of a leaflet is about something else. So what we need to do is to be there on the ground campaigning with our local communities on the issues that are concerning and worrying them and being their absolute best ally on the ground. In addition, and separate from, I would say, the electoral work that has to carry on, which is why we probably need more members, so we need a membership drive. As far as uh, the GDP, it's there at the core of uh, Green Party policy, but that's not a way to measure things. IMF, World Trade Organization, they have to be absolutely uh, binned or changed, ratings agencies, gone. Let's talk to people, let's talk to transitions towns, let's get the well-being of people, jobs and a uh, shorter working week out there as part of our campaigning policy. Right, well to answer John, what's my USP? And I guess my background, I come from a slightly different place. I've either been in business or helping businesses for most of my working career. And that gives me a different perspective. And, um, and I think sometimes it's perspective the Greens uh, do lack when they're out there, the credibility from the point of view of the people who are actually trying to earn a living in a different way. So I've worked on the environmental side with businesses to improve um, the dyes they use, the paints they use, um, the, the sort of environmental impact of their own businesses. So I'm coming from a different perspective and that probably makes me a bit unusual. Um, I am going to be the, uh, a reasonable one because I'm impatient. Um, I annoy journalists all the time. Uh, as a leader of Green Party in Wales, uh, I'm creating press releases often and I'm making sure they print them otherwise. I mean, they just do it to keep me you know, out of the way because it, it, you know, the stuff being printed in Wales, which England doesn't know about, um, which is because we've got quite a high profile, uh, whether it's the M4 widening consultation, um, whether it's biofuels factories, incinerators, you, the, you know, if, if it's got a slight green leaning, we know now that we're going to get published. Well, this has to spread out to England. I mean, I know we do well, but, you know, it, 
you've really, really got to be unreasonable in your expectations. As a teacher once said to me, Pippa, you've got to reach for the stars, then you know you're going to hit the top of the tree. And I think that's what we Greens have got to do. We've actually got to reach very, very high. And it takes enormous amounts of energy. In Wales, we don't have paid staff. Everyone's a volunteer doing what they can between other jobs. So yes, my USP is to be unreasonable, and I come from a different background. Um, single issue, yeah, I know I've got the same problem everybody else has got, but we're not a single issue uh, party. And as things and the weather start to change, we are going to provide the hows. How do we get out of this mess? How do we help people move into the future, into new industries, into renewable industries? How do we affect the training? I think our policies and everything we've worked on is providing the hows, and we have to go out there and say, we have got a lot of the answers. We know they're good, we've been working on them for 30 years. Now, are you ready to listen? And this is something I think we have to go out there and do. Uh, finally, um, presenting a post-GDP model, well, clearly, we're moving to a position where people are now understanding money isn't the great god anymore. It's a slow process, but valuing things in monetary terms is not going to be the way the future goes. And I have a lot of friends in the Labour Party, in Plaid Cymru, etc., and they are all working in a similar way. How do we value life and success and attainment, which is non-monetary? 